Well, hello friends, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch here, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're so delighted that you've tuned into the broadcast today as we begin a brand new series on the life of faith. We believe it's going to be a great blessing to you as we learn how to negotiate these challenging times together. But before we get into the message, as always, we want to remind you of the resources we have free and available for you at randylanebunch.org. If you'll go there, look under the media link, you'll find all of the Connecting Point Communications resources that are available. Our magazine, blog, podcast, past editions of our television broadcast on the YouTube channel, which of course, we would love it if you would stop there, subscribe, like, and comment. That'd be a great blessing to us. Our healing school is also under the media link. Just so many wonderful resources, free and available for you 24 seven on that website, randylanebunch.org. In addition to that, as always, we would love to hear from you. So if you would email us at info at connectingpc.org, give us your testimony, give us a praise report of how the broadcast has been a blessing to you. We would really, really love to hear it. Also, don't forget, we have our other channel, offroadadventures.org. That's the website. And again, under the media link, you can find the YouTube channel. And even from the uh, media link there at offroadadventures.org, you can access our videos, our devotionals, some of our scenic photography, just a bunch of things there that we love to do in our off-roading hobby. Uh, but we also turned it into a ministry to reach those that share that passion with us. And we believe that some of those things can be a blessing to you, even if you're not into off-roading. We still believe some of that content would be a great blessing to you. Well, as I said today, we're going to begin a brand new series. I think we'll go probably at least a couple of weeks on this, on this idea of the life of faith. As believers, we are to live a life of faith. In fact, the Bible says, and I'm going to read this verse of scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, I very seldom take a verse and lift it out of its setting and just preach on one verse of scripture, but that is a standalone verse. That is simply a truth for the believer, that we as Christians don't walk by sight, by what we can see, rather we're to walk by faith. We're to walk on the basis of our convictions of what God has said, the immutable, unchangeable, unshakable kingdom that lies beyond the realm of sight. Our faith is not in what we see, our faith is in God and the immutable verities of his kingdom. Walking is a means of conveyance. When we say we walk by faith, not by sight, what does that mean? Well, if I want a cup of coffee and I'm sitting in the living room watching TV, I've got to stand up and utilize my legs to walk from the couch to the kitchen to access the coffee pot. And if I don't utilize my legs, I don't know, maybe I can utilize my wife's legs as she's in a good mood and she'll give me a cup of coffee. And sometimes she just does that to bless me. But by and large, friends, we understand that if we're going to go from one place to another, We've got to walk there. We've got to utilize our legs. Well, faith is our spiritual legs, you might say. If we're going to move forward in the things of the kingdom, if we're going to access and move forward in our walk with God, we're going to have to do so by faith because these are unseen realities. You can't do it with your physical hand, your physical legs, your physical eye. You have to do it through the eye of faith, looking not at what we can see from the natural standpoint, but what we see beyond the veil, looking to God's unchangeable truths in his word. In fact, you know, if you think about it, if we were to be moved by what we see in the world today, I mean, dear Lord, right here in America, I don't know how it is where you live, but we have soaring gas prices here in the state of California. We're paying over $6 a gallon for gas. Just a few years ago, it was a couple dollars a gallon. Food is skyrocketing in cost. And in fact, there are food shortages. It's very difficult for those of us that have been used to living in the land of plenty. Of course, other parts of the world, it's extremely dire and more severe. And of course, there are people that are even suffering for their faith in many nations of the world. These are difficult times in which to live. And if we were going to be moved by what we saw, it would be easy to despair. In fact, that's why stress and anxiety are at an all-time high. During the time of the pandemic, suicide hotlines were off the charts. People were being moved by what they saw, by the distress they were feeling. In fact, Jesus characterized our times in Matthew 21, 26, as a time when men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of these things which are coming on the earth. But friend, just because that's the state of those who are living by sight, living by what they see, being victims of their circumstances, that is not the way it should be for the believer because we realize that beyond the seen realities of this world, there is a higher unchanging truth found in the promises of God's word. And in fact, just a couple of verses after Jesus said that he, what he did about men's hearts failing them, he said in verse 28 of that same chapter, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads for, because your redemption draws near. So what's the difference? The difference is what you're looking at. We need to look at life with a different set 
of optics. Are we merely looking at what we can see from the natural standpoint, or are we again looking past our circumstances, looking past the crisis of the current moment to the unfailing, unchanging, immutable principles and truths of God's word, that unshakable kingdom that will never fall. Again, we need to be looking at life with a different set of of optics. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is not blindness. When people talk about blind faith, faith is just simply looking past what we see at more sure realities. And so we're still seeing, we're just seeing with a different set of eyes. It's the eye of faith which sees the unchangeable truths of God's word. In fact, go with me if you would to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, John speaks of this faith life, this faith walk. And listen to what he says here. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, he says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, it's, it's very simple. If you're a child of God, victory is potentially yours. I, I do a straw poll when I preach on this verse. I said, how many believe that Jesus is the Son of God? The Bible said, these are the ones who have victory over the world, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet we know that there are a lot of believers who are not experiencing victory in their lives. Why? Because the Bible said the victory that overcomes the world is faith. And the reason why we even come to faith in Christ is because we believe beyond the seen realm to those unchanging, immutable truths of God's word. We believe in the redemption of Jesus Christ, not because we've ever met Jesus, not because we were there when he died on the cross, but we believe the testimony of his word. Through faith, we appropriate the promise that God has made available to us in the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So the question is, what are we believing? What are we affirming? Are we affirming what the evening news is telling us? Are we affirming the bad news that we're seeing, you know, in our day-to-day -day experience in life, at work, or wherever we're going? Or we are, are we affirming the Word of God, which is unchangeable and unshaken by the things that we're experiencing in this life? God and His promises are real and true, and if we'll cling to those immutable truths, we'll be unshaken no matter how dire the circumstances are. You know, again, faith means that we're not moved by what we see, but by what we believe. I want to give you a real practical outworking of this in our everyday life. I want to go to James chapter 1, and we'll read these verses in just a moment, but I just want to ask you something. Maybe you can relate to this. I certainly can. Have you noticed that the devil has a song that he loves to sing to the Christian who's maybe in a pressure point in life? And that little song has about a million verses, and they're all the same thing. The song is entitled, What Are You Going to Do? And all the verses are the same. What are you going to do? Oh, dear God, you don't know what you're going to do. I mean, did you anticipate this stress? Did you anticipate this problem? Did you know you were going to be laid off? Did you know you were going to get that diagnosis? Did you know the bill was going to be that much? What are you going to do? The devil loves to sing that little song to us. And oftentimes, if we start playing according to, you know, the little um, scenario, the little narrative that he wants to paint for us, we begin to play into that and say, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. Well, number one, that is unscriptural. And then, you know, right behind that, you'll hear people say, I just can't hear the voice of God. I, I, I just keep trying to pray and seek the face of God. I just don't know what God wants me to do. Well, you're unscriptural on several fronts. First and foremost, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Uh, they hear me and follow me. If you look at John chapter 10, Jesus makes no bones about the fact that if we're his sheep, we can not only hear his voice, but we'll know his voice from the voice of strangers. We can distinguish the authentic voice of the master speaking and guiding and directing us. Not only that, but as James says here, his guidance and direction are for the taking. Listen to what James says in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. We'll just start with verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, what is wisdom? As I, I like to say it this way, wisdom is God's walk to do. If you ever come to a fork in the road and you didn't know what to do, Lord, I don't know whether I should turn right or left. Should I attend this church or that church? Should I marry this person or that person? Should I go to this university or take this trade school opportunity? That's a cry for wisdom. And we all come to the point where from the natural standpoint, we don't know what to do. But what we don't want to do is just wring our hands and say, oh, dear Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Dear God, what am I going to do? Um, that, that's unbelief because what we're looking at are our circumstances. You know, it's interesting. There's a word, I believe it's the word perplexed. And the word perplex basically means having a number of options, none of which are good. <laughs> and that's exactly where the devil wants to get us. He wants us to get us to, into a point where we're perplexed, where all the options look untenable. They don't look like they're a positive option for us. You know, what's behind door number one, door number two, and door number three all look negative. 
But the Bible said that if we lack wisdom, we can ask God who gives liberally. So if you don't know what to do, don't stand around saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. What does the Bible say to do? The Bible says that God gives liberally to all those who ask him for wisdom. So I might say, I don't know what to do now, but thank God God does. And I'm going to go to him in faith, believing and ask him for his what to do. I love to say God's got a what to do for you. And if you're stuck, if you're perplexed, if all the options you're looking at don't look good, it's because you haven't found God's solution for you. You haven't found God's what to do for you. But God has wisdom for you, my friend. But the Bible said that you've got to come before the throne of grace and appropriate what he's made available. The Bible said we can appropriate mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And part of that grace provision God's made available to us is his wisdom. So again, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach it will be given to him. But then notice verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, this is a very simple faith principle, but I think it's important that we bring this out. A lot of times people don't understand how the life of faith works. And as a result of that, they're always kind of undermining their own faith. So I want to read a simple verse of scripture too. And we're going to look at this verse in more detail a little bit later. But for right now, I just want to read Mark 11, 24. We're going to read it in its context and the larger story around that passage later. But I just want to read this verse of scripture to you. Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I want you to notice the tenses of this verse. Again, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, number one, believe that you receive them. When would you be doing that? Right then and there when you pray. Believe you receive when you pray. That's exactly what James says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and upbraids not or without reproach, and it will be given to him. So what do we do? We pray, we ask God for wisdom, and by faith, we receive it. Now, does that mean that at that moment, I'm any wiser, that I immediately have my answer or my solution? No, because the Bible said you believe that you receive them and you will have them. So that means I may not have it right at the moment. I kind of like it like this. I, this this is a brand new shirt that I'm wearing. I, I like the clothes from Orvis, which is kind of a fly fishing company, but they have a lot of outdoor clothes. And so I like their stuff. I used to live in New England and they had an outlet up there in Maine. I loved Orvis stuff. It's very heavy duty. And so the other day, uh, some of my shirts were getting a little bit short and I decided, you know, I need to order some of the same shirts, but in the tall length. And so I did that. I got online I found the Orvis website. They had a wonderful deal. Buy two, get one free. I clicked the put it in your cart. And then I purchased those things. And it gave me a receipt, an invoice immediately that my order had been received. So liken that into praying and believing God. When I place that order, that's the same thing as believing I receive when I pray. The transaction is complete. But guess what? I didn't have the shirts yet. So did I say, oh my God. What am I going to do? I don't have shirts. I need shirts. No, I've ordered the shirts. I've already taken care of that, but you don't have them yet. Yeah, but I will. <laughs> They're on their way. They're in process. And you know what? I'm wearing one today. It didn't happen immediately, but I believed I received when I ordered. And then sure enough, they came when I needed them and I'm wearing one today. Praise God. The same thing happens when we pray. We believe we receive when we pray and we will have. Yeah, but I need that wisdom right now. Well, you believed you received it. So thank God you have it. Now, what a lot of people want is they want God to respond on their timetable. And I have found that oftentimes God doesn't do that. Number one, if he did that every time, we wouldn't, I don't know that we would rely on him in the same way. There's something about looking to God with expectation that is an act of faith that pleases him. So another analogy along this line, I remember one of my favorite Bible teachers talking about the same principle. He talked about the fact that when he ordered his laptop, he did the same thing. He went online, got the specs that he wanted. He ordered that laptop. And as far as he was concerned, it was done. He's got himself a new, in fact, he went probably and started telling his friends, I got myself a brand new laptop. Oh, wonderful. Let's see it. Well, I don't have it yet. You don't? I thought you said you had a new laptop. I do. I ordered it. It's on its way. But what that did was it fostered a sense of expectation in his heart, just like it did me when I ordered these shirts. So he said, every time a UPS truck is driving by, he's looking out the window. Is that my laptop? He's not in doubt that it's coming. He is in expectation, believing that it's on its way. And friend, we need to do the same thing when it comes to wisdom. If we don't know what to do, let's ask of God who gives to all liberally. I'm telling you, Orvis was ready to give me those shirts liberally because they were going to get some money for them, right? 
And so I had no doubt that Orvis's will was to give me the shirts. I had no doubt that it was my will to have the shirts. We just had to go through the process. And likewise, if you want something from heaven, pray the prayer of faith, live by faith, have confidence in God. Listen, if I can have enough confidence in Orvis, not to be calling them every day and asking, where are those shirts? You know, I ordered those shirts the other day. <laughs> then I ought to have enough faith in God that if I order wisdom, if you will, from the throne of grace, I'm just using that terminology for illustration purposes. We don't order God around, but you know my, what I'm saying. If I pray and believe God for wisdom, I'm not going to check back with him every five minutes. Now, Lord, you did hear me, right? That wisdom is on its way, isn't it? No, I'm going to trust that God heard me because I prayed in line with his will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we've asked of him, we know we have the petitions we've desired of him. So friend, listen, if I've prayed and believed God for wisdom, then I've done my part. So I can thank God. Thank you, Father. Your wisdom is on its way. I'm looking with expectation out my window, waiting for that wisdom to come. And sometimes we don't need things exactly when we think we do. We just want the stress to be relieved. But friend, if we believed we received when we prayed, we shouldn't have any stress or anxiety. In fact, we should be thanking God the answer is on its way and trusting that God is faithful to his word. Listen, friend, if I can trust Orvis, I can certainly trust God. And so I'm going to pray and believe that God is a God of his word, that his immutable promises are true, despite the fact that there might still be chaos and turmoil, people still pulling on me for an answer. I'm going to steadfastly de declare and proclaim God's truth is still, uh, is still true. God's word is still true. The foundation is sure, and his wisdom is on its way to me. Praise the Lord. I can say, I know I'm going to know what I need to do when I need to do it. Again, what are you affirming? You know, one of the things when it comes to the life of faith is making sure that we're hanging around people of faith. Let me read a verse of scripture to you that you can probably identify with. 2 Corinthians 4.13. The apostle Paul here is talking about what he calls the spirit of faith. Listen to what he says. He says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. I like that. Listen, listen, to, listen to it again. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Let me just say this to you. We're always saying what we believe. It might be a lot of unbelief, but that's what we're believing. We're believing the devil's report over God's report. You're going to say what you believe. And in fact, we can locate where your faith is at by what you're saying oftentimes. Now, you know, in guarded moments, you might put up a good you know, facade. You might put up good faith pretense uh, and quote all the right verses and say all the right things. But in an unguarded moment, uh, you know, when you're not thinking about, you know, putting your best faith foot forward, uh, all of a sudden we begin to hear the unbelief coming out of your mouth. It's so important that we hang around people with a spirit of faith. I like to say it this way. The principles of faith, the law of faith is taught. The spirit of faith is caught. That's why I love hanging around people that have a spirit of faith. They're just the people that believe God can, God will. If God spoke to you, he'll bring it to pass. And they just dare to believe God for great things. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, when I went to start my church in New England many years ago, I did it on nothing more than a conviction that God was speaking to my heart. Now, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're just kind of Flow it out of our hearts today. Is that all right? I hope so, because that's what we're going to do anyway. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm in Hebrews chapter 11, but I want to particularly read this verse out of the New American Standard uh, translation. It might take me just a sec to get here, but there's a reason why I want to read this to you out of this translation. Listen to what it says here. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Listen to this. The conviction of things not seen. I remember years ago, I was in the traveling ministry, traveling with another brother, doing what we called Holy Ghost meetings around the country. Man, it was blessed. God touched those meetings, blessed people all over the country. It was a wonderful time and season of ministry. But as we came to the end of that six-year season, I began to sense that God was dealing with my heart to step back into the pastorate. I can't go into a lot of detail about that but uh, because it would take too long to go into all the details. But over a process of time, he began to warm my heart and mind back to the idea of going and pioneering a new work. I was living in Oklahoma at the time, and I began to feel that God was leading me to go and start a church in New England, in the state of Vermont, which we did, and we were there for 10 years. Now, I spent a lot of time in Vermont as an itinerant minister, but God began to speak to my heart about establishing a church there. I shared with those that were going to be affected by that decision, and to a man or to a woman, they all agreed, you've heard the voice of God. This is the voice of the Lord. And I knew that I had heard from God. Now, I didn't have a church in Vermont. 
I didn't have anybody necessarily saying, I'm going to back you in your, you know, uh, venture to go start a church in Vermont. What did I have? I had a word from God. So what did I do? I began to tell everybody, I'm going to Vermont to start a church. In fact, I was still in the traveling ministry. And as I went into church after church after church, I began to let them know about the vision that God had given me. And I'll never forget this. You know, as I began to share, uh, pastors began to commit to support us. In fact, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me about that ahead of time. He said, I want you to start a partnership program. I want you to call it Vision Vermont. Don't go after individuals. Let churches know what you're going to do and let them commit to support you. He said, because if churches support you, they're going to put you in their monthly missions giving and it'll be like clockwork. It'll come to you month after month. Now, God is speaking this to my heart. But I remember as I began to share the vision with pastors, sure enough, one after the other began to commit financially to support us. Because, you know, we were a proven ministry. Many of them knew us either through our attendant ministry or years before. You know, we've been in the ministry for quite a, a while by this time, at least, what, 12 years full time by that time. Now we've been in the ministry, dear God, you know, a lot, a long time, over 35 years full time, 40 years preaching. But at that time, we'd already kind of established ourselves as, you know, a legitimate ministry. A lot of these guys knew us. And one by one, they began to commit to support us. And everywhere we went, we began telling people, we're going to start a church in Vermont. And people, because we believed it, people began to believe it. I'll never forget uh, my pastor, Mark Brzee, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were attending uh, his church there. Wonderful church. Still a wonderful church. And, uh, you know, missions giving church. And so we, we were going to a special meeting at the time. A number of ministers were there. I remember I went down to the prayer line and uh, Brother Mark looked at me in that prayer line, pointed a finger at me, stood in front of me and gave me a word of confirmation regarding the ministry that we're about to step into, which was the Vermont church. And so after he gave me that word to confirm the call of God on my life, I said, Brother Mark, could I meet with you? I'd like to share with you the vision God has given us. Well, I, I met him in his office. You got to understand, Brother Mark was a hero of mine. I mean, he was, had been closely associated with Brother Hagan, who was my spiritual father. Uh, he had this wonderful World Outreach Church of Tulsa that was, you know, shaking the nations for Christ. And here I am, you know, just kind of an itinerant minister attending his church. I didn't even know if he knew who I was. I don't even think he knew my name at that time. But God had showed him that God had spoken to our hearts. So as I'm sharing with him the vision about going to Vermont and pioneering this church and some of the other things, I mean, I could sense it. I could feel it out of my own heart. My faith was contagious. I mean, I was all, all but preaching on top of his desk, you know, to him about the vision God had given us in Vermont. And, you know, by the time I left that office, he said, you know what? We believe you. And in fact, we're going to commit to supporting you $250 a month. They did that. Other churches did that. Some more, some less. But by the time, friend, it was over, we had enough support to help help us underwrite. Didn't underwrite the whole thing, but it helped us to underwrite the expenses of that ministry so we could go and pioneer that work in Vermont. There's something about a spirit of faith that's contagious. And I want to ask you, what are the kind of people you're hanging around? Are they can-do people that believe that if God has spoken it, he'll bring it to pass? Because friend, that's the kind of people we need to be around. We need to be around people that had have a spirit of faith. In fact, you know, going back to uh, Let's go back to that passage. I'm already, you know, here in the New American Standard, so I'll just stay with it. But the Bible said, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. What men? The men that it's talking about in this chapter in the great heroes of faith. But then notice what verse 3 says. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made of things which are visible. Now, I'm going to read that again, and I want to point out a couple of key parts to it. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. Now, when we think of this verse, we think that this is saying that God made the worlds, the planets, the physical universe through his word so that what is seen, the natural material world, came out of that which is not seen, which is the word of God. And that is true. But there's something more to it, I believe, than that. This word worlds here, I've got a little number by it. And if I click that number, it's a number one. If I click that number, it says literally, meaning literally in the Greek, that word is not planets, it's the word ages. Actually, I think it's like eons. It means time periods. And in fact, even today, scientists talk about space-time. They don't just talk about space or time. They talk about space-time. So what it's really saying here is that the ages were prepared by the word of God. Now, if you wrap all this together, what is it saying? It's really saying that the ages, the time periods in which all these great men of faith lived were shaped, framed, formed, and fashioned by faith-filled men who heard a word from God and acted on what he said. Think about Abraham. What did, what did Abraham hear? 
Go to a nation that, or go to a land that you know not. I'll give it to you and your descendants. It'll be their nation. So Abraham did like we did. He just got up and went. He began to tell people, this is what we're going to do. His whole family went with him. And uh, of course, the nation of Israel was ultimately established. And of course, the people ultimately inherited the land. You can talk about Noah. He built a boat, never having seen it rain before. Uh, but he built a boat to the saving of his family because he was motivated. The Bible said he was moved uh, with faith or he feared the Lord. He was moved by faith. And, and, you know, sometimes you can have such a conviction of what God is saying. Noah had a conviction about the end of the world coming. So he was motivated by fear. Not fear uh, in a negative way, but the fear of God. I mean, this the, the end's going to come. I need to act in faith on what God told me so I can be an answer of salvation or so that my faith obedience can provide an answer of salvation to those who will likewise believe. And of course, because he was a preacher of righteousness for a hundred years, he was letting people know the end is coming. I'm going to build this boat. You can get on the boat with me. Now they didn't believe they perished, but Noah and his family, thank God, were saved because he believed and he was moved with godly fear and built the boat to the saving of his family. I think about myself, my life of faith. I think, hey man, I've, I've got, I've got a little part in that Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, Hebrews 11 is still being written by men of faith who are shaping and framing their world because they've heard from God and they're doing what he said. It's as simple as that. So let me ask you, are you hanging around people that when you say, I believe God spoke to my heart, that they're saying, well, if God said it, he'll bring it to pass, brother. You know, you know, sometimes people say God spoke to him when he didn't, but there are times where young people, for example, will seek the face of God and God will tell them to do something daring that involves from risk from the natural standpoint. But friend, if God truly said it, is there any risk involved? If God really said it and we exercise faith and do what God told us to do, how much risk is there really if God is backing us? You know, when we told people we're going to Vermont, we're planting a church, we did just that. And because the people believed it, because that spirit of faith was contagious, they supported what we did and God brought his vision to pass. Always it's more than just the individual to whom God speaks. There are those who pray, those who stand in faith, those who support, those who follow the vision and go with the man of God to see it accomplished. And we had a lot of help from a lot of different sources. But I'm telling you, that spirit of faith was contagious and it caused people to believe and get behind what we were doing. So what has God said to you, friend? Uh, what about wisdom? Maybe you're in a situation right now where you, I don't know what to do. Dear God, I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? <laughs> I'll tell you what we're going to do. Right now, you and I are going to pray and believe God for wisdom. And let me just say this. If you don't know Jesus, the wisest thing you can do is accept him as your Lord and Savior. You know, Jesus is the shepherd. He leads the sheep. And if you're without guidance, you need a shepherd to guide you out of the troubled times that we're facing in this world today. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, why don't you just pray and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my shepherd. I believe you died for me to pay the penalty for my sins, Lord. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Lead me where you want me to go. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to hear from you, friend. Email me at info at connectingpc.org. But let's pray together for wisdom right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my friends watching this broadcast. They may be like I have been in so many situations where the pressure was on. It felt like time was pressing. Somebody wanted an answer. I didn't know what to do. But Father, right now, collectively, our eyes are upon you. Like Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, facing five armies coming against him. He said, Lord, we have no power or might against this great army, but our eyes are upon you. Lord, our eyes are on you. We're asking you, Father, for direction and wisdom. By faith, we receive that wisdom that you liberally give your children. And we thank you, Father God, that we will know exactly what we need to do. And we thank you that you'll open the doors necessary for us to fulfill your will, your plan, your purpose for our lives. We give you thanks and praise for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you need a healing touch from heaven, let me pray for you. Father, we pray that you would reach out and touch your people now. Minister life and healing to those watching the broadcast today. We pray that, Father God, broken limbs would be made whole. We thank you that crooked backs would be made straight. We command tumors to disappear and die in the name of Jesus. Barren wombs be opened. Blind eyes see. Deaf ears hear. Father, we pray that your miracle working power would go forth and touch those watching the broadcast today. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, go to randylanebunch.org. Under the media link, you'll find the resources that will continue to minister to your life and be a blessing to you. And we'll see you next time on Connecting Point. Mm -hmm.